Childless clones perished in the Clone Wars, many in terrible ways, such as being eaten alive by a Rishi eel, or an undead Genosian zombie, straight up Ventrist, or this. But what about these guys? Or these? Or these? Countless more clones perished off screen in Star Wars The Clone Wars, many before disembarking their LAAT gunships and many after delivering clones in gunships and trying to return to a larger ship or a base of some kind. It's those latter clones which we're discussing in this video. The LAAT pilot shot out of the flak littered skies of the Clone Wars. Once hit, did any of them have a chance at surviving? Why don't we ever see anyone try to contact or find these poor clones? How'd it get burned? 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 I don't know! Attention, Sergeant on deck! To answer these most pertinent question, it helps to know a little bit more about LAAT gunships and their variants. LAAT or Low Altitude Assault Transport Slash Infantry Gunship was the Galactic Republic's primary mode of air-based infantry transport throughout the Clone Wars. The reason it looked like it was pregnant was that it was designed to carry up to 30 clone troopers into battle, probably to their deaths or alternatively one on free tar to a senate buffet. The gunships were designed and manufactured by Rathana Heavy Engineering, one of the few major manufacturing companies which didn't bend over for the Techno Union, and some troopers called the LAAT LATI, but nobody liked the clones who did. Repulsor lifts and sheer rule of cool kept LAAT gunships in the air, and while they could bear the icy void well enough to be dispatched to a planet from orbit, they hadn't the power to get back in orbit without the help of a carrier vessel. While in a planet's atmosphere, depending of course on the composition of that atmosphere, they could carry their soon to be dead clone cargo at speeds of more than 600 kilometers an hour, or 373 miles per hour, if we're using a flawed system of measurement. And it was while LAAT gunships were in a planet's atmosphere that they were most effective. Despite mostly being transport craft, they could pack a pretty decent punch, making use of laser turrets jutting from hatches and bubbles, missile launchers capable of launching homing missiles, high explosive missiles, high explosive armor piercing missiles and anti-personnel fragmentation missiles, and air-to-air -air rockets. With said weaponry, they could make a hot mess of infantry, landbound vehicles, other aircraft and even some starfighters. Though more often than not, the lightly armored LAAT gunships were blasted out of the sky before they could do anything of use, plummeting to the earth like a school bus full of cosplayers who forgot to wear their seatbelts. Most LAAT gunships had speeder bikes stowed in their trunks, though other LAAT variants could transport more than just a couple of bikes and a couple of dozen Kiwi lookalikes. Low altitude assault transport carriers or simply LAAT slash C's could deliver tanks and walkers, also for swift destruction in what was little more than a game of chess played between Palpatine and Palpatine, and low altitude assault transport slash vehicles or simply LAAT slash V's could carry a whole lot of extra speeder bikes. Most clones didn't like this however, as it meant they couldn't share speeders with another clone, and that was about as much affection as a clone got without going to a cheap cantina on Coruscant. The LAAT infantry gunships themselves could be fitted out for sneaky sneaky transport missions by adding engine baffles, shields and electromagnetic emission and heat signature reducing black polymers to the craft and removing its bulkier weapons. Also, it was not uncommon for clones to grow attached to their gunships and stain them with all manner of custom paintings, such as those of Banthas dropping their guts or Twi'lek girls in midriff versions of clone armor. Saucy. When LAAT infantry pilots were about ready to ditch their clone cargo and then swerve off into the direct path of a Separatist missile, they switched the cabin lights to red. And when they were ready, ready, they would switch them to green, either opening the doors and letting the clones saunter out into blaster fire, or floating a good 30 meters up in the air and making the clones lower themselves to the blood-soaked earth on cables. This latter option was a particularly effective method for killing clones. 
But what happens when said Separatist missile hit and that clone pilot dropped his guts just like the Bantha painted on the nose of his LAAT, which was up in flames and losing altitude? Well, that relates to one of our big questions, which has an unsurprisingly little answer. The pilot would make use of the emergency feature of the cockpit capsule, which allowed it to eject from the rest of the craft, just like an escape pod. If he didn't do this, he was probably already dead or freaking the hell out as he literally cooked alive in his own Republic issue armor. So in answer to our first question, yes, the pilots had a chance of surviving as their LAAT gunships were indeed equipped with a bailout mechanism. Though what about our second question? Why don't we ever see anyone try to contact or find these poor clones? Well, we've already sort of answered that indirectly. A clone who successfully ejected from an LAAT could very likely contact their commanding officer or simply fly the escape pod back to base, whereas most of the clones who didn't eject were very likely dead and were hence not a mess worth cleaning up until after the battle. Escape pod or not, clone pilots did their absolute best to fly LAAT gunships for characters with plot armor to which no width of Durasteel could compare. Alternatively, if the escape pod detached from the LAAT successfully but was damaged, rendering it incapable of flight and standard communication, most escape pods featured emergency communication systems, even as simple beacons and flares, and most contained a few weeks of rations, medicine, and other items which may have been essential to survival, such as survival shelters, breath masks, and even blasters. This certainly improved a pilot's chance of surviving, only for them to live long enough to execute Order 66 and watch the Republic crumble with a droid-like indifference. Speaking of droids, most LAAT gunships carried an IM-6 battlefield medical droid, which was stowed in a locker next to the clone trooper's downtime magazines, until the poor thing became of use. If an LAAT hit Earth and the pilot managed to survive without bailing out, it was possible he could have treated his injuries and spared himself from death by activating the droid. Assuming help wasn't coming, the pilot's survival would be in his own hands and he would have to contest with a potentially foreign and hostile environment. Though again, the escape pods were equipped for situations like this. But what do you think guys? Do you think the LAAT infantry was as great as the Republic made it out to be? Do you think many clones survived LAAT crashes? Do you think the Republic cared if they did, assuming they weren't one of the A-listers like Rex or Cody? What sort of icon would you paint on the nose of your LAAT? And what could we have possibly meant by downtime magazines? Feel free to post your thoughts in the comments section below. And just before you go guys, please make sure you check out all those juicy links in the description below waiting for your clicks, including our Geetsy's Gaming Network, where you can join us on Gary's Mod and Roblox and play games with other Star Wars fans, our main Geetsy's Discord, where you can chat with other Star Wars fans and myself, and the Patreon if you want to help the channel out. If you do decide to donate, you get access to a special behind the scenes Discord where you can see how myself and my team work. Anyways guys, as always, thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you in the next video. Thank <laughs> you.